This year, one of my New Year's resolutions was to allow myself to play more single player games, or at least diversify what I was playing more so than the previous two years. Towards the end of 2019, I realised I felt I was in a bit of a rut with my hobby of playing games, where I would wake up, go to work, come home, and play one of the same two games, Dead by Daylight or Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. And while I still enjoy playing both, playing only these two and continuously trying to play at a level I was satisfied with started to proper get me down, to the point where I wondered if I was even having fun playing games anymore. I needed a break, so in the run up to Christmas I ended up playing through the entirety of the 2008 Prince of Persia remake, a game which I had owned for 10 years and barely touched, and when all was said and done I actually ended up really liking it. It was so refreshing to just wind down and just enjoy a game for what it was, and the fact that it was so refreshing to me was honestly a little scary. i have been playing games since I was like 3, and it's been my hobby for as long as I can remember, and the fact that I was actively starting to resent it did upset me. So, this year I made a change, and I'm happy to report that after playing 35 different games this year and having so many cool and different and fun experiences, that I'm still as enamoured with video games as I've always been. While I've been playing these games, I've been keeping a note of what I've played over the course of the year, and marking down which game was my favourite in every month. Mostly this was for posterity purposes, but I thought it'd be a fun idea to do mini reviews of each and put them into a big video at the end of the year, to celebrate the fun I've had falling back in love with my favourite hobby. This one's going to be more akin to my video covering every 3D Sonic game as opposed to my 36 minute diatribe about forces, just quick little snapshots of my overall thoughts on each game. So without further ado, I'm Hobpunks and these are all of the video games that I've played this year. My year started off with a trip to Galar and Pokemon Shield. I was sceptical initially on whether I'd even buy this game because of my views on Moon, but I enjoyed Shield enough. I enjoyed the stadium setting of battles and the roster of Pokemon this time around is really nice and I enjoy their designs a lot. I also like how the champion is actually somewhat of a challenge. Generally though, the game is far too easy. I'm not going to go on about story because it's a Pokemon game and to be honest they've never really bothered to have those and I do quite enjoy the music. Unfortunately though, the more I think about Shield, the more it falls apart for how bare bones it feels. And this is one of two games that I think time has really affected my opinion on. If I'd been writing this earlier in the year, I'd have definitely been more positive towards this game. But as it stands, I only just enjoyed Shield enough. The next game I played in 2020 was something I'd had my eye on since its release. I'd been wanting to play Hat in Time for quite some time, but never quite seemed to get round to it. But oh boy, I am so glad that I did. Hat in Time is some of the most pure 3D platforming fun I've had in years. Hat Kid controls like a dream, the levels are all unique in setting, design and structure, and I absolutely adore the soundtrack. One major thing that stuck out to me though is, oh my lord I like these boss fights a lot. They're simple, but the movement and the way you quickly launch and dodge attacks is something that I think a certain other franchise could learn from. It's pure platforming bliss from beginning to end, and I'd absolutely wholeheartedly recommend you play it, even if you're only a passive fan of platformers. The final game I played in January was probably something I should have been aiming to play towards the end of last year, but oh well. The original Luigi's Mansion is one of the coolest little games of all time. Dark Moon on 3DS was a fan enough sequel for fans wanting more Lugie action, and Luigi's Mansion 3 manages to find a great balance between the two. The varied and wholly unique flaws of the hotel keep things fresh, and the added gimmicks of Luigi and the Poltergust's new capabilities make for some fun new puzzles. Shoutouts to the gardening floor and movie studio especially. I enjoyed Luigi's Mansion 3 more than Dark Moon because of its less disjointed setting, structure, and overall atmosphere. And while I still don't think it measures up to the original in this way, it does so much right on its own, has so much charm, and keeps things so fresh, that it's fun from beginning to end. My favourite game that I played in January was definitely A Hat in Time. While I did enjoy the time I spent with the other two games I played this month, Hat in Time's design, writing, tone, aesthetic and mastery of the platforming genre just puts it over the top for me. If you're a fan of platformers, it is a must play. First person shooters were something I didn't delve into terribly often after I got bored of COD after Modern Warfare 3, aside from multiplayer stuff like Halo and Overwatch of course. 
Doom was the first single player FPS I'd experienced in 9 years and I am so happy I gave this game a shot. This game is 100 miles per hour of pure demon slaying fun from beginning to end. From the pistol to the super shotgun to my bare dang fists, I felt unstoppable. But this doesn't mean the game was too easy. In fact, I felt the difficulty was incredibly fair and tested your skills well throughout. Levels incorporating a decent amount of platforming and exploration was also very welcome and slaying demons to Mick Gordon's phenomenal soundtrack brought everything together into a perfect testosterone room fueled ultraviolet dream of a game. The next game I played was Mirror's Edge Catalyst and this is by far the most heartbreaking game I've played thus far. I'm a massive fan of the original and I was incredibly excited for this sequel and while I took my time to pick it up I was expecting more of the same fun I had with the first game and then I played this game. The open world stuff is a neat idea but it makes the individual missions feel less unique because you've been to most of the areas they take place in already. The parkour feels a little smoother but also a bit clunkier. I can't quite explain why but to me it just feels a bit less fluent than the original. The game makes combat a little bit more complicated but overall a bit smoother but the need for combat is massively reduced here so it didn't really mean much. I also didn't care about the game's story at all. I thought it was a prequel but no, it's a complete reboot with more characters who are less cool. The reason I like the plot of Mirror's Edge 1 is because it keeps it simple but only has a few characters within it so it works out. I don't know man, I just feel like this game made me understand how people felt about the first game. Unfortunately, for me, this one was a massive and genuine disappointment. I have my girlfriend to thank for this one, as over the course of our relationship we've played through the entire Bioshock series together. We've started this one over and over quite a few times, but before Rona hit we decided to sit down together and play through it fully when I visited her on weekends. Infinite is a gorgeous game. Its departure from Under the Sea allowed the developers to design a much brighter and varied world above the clouds. The combat being changed up to only allow you to carry two weapons at one time or one vigor is a weird change at face value but makes how you use each of the weapons and the cool and unique vigors matter more in the heat of combat. I also find myself, compared to the other games, way more immersed in the story this time round, and I liked how it was integrated into gameplay as well with the concept of the tears. I think I'd say Infinite is my favourite of the three Bioshocks, as while it strays from its darker roots for straight up FPS adventure, I was eager to play more each and every time I visited my girlfriend. I bet you can't guess which of these games wasn't in contention for my game of the month. Both of the shooters I played this month were great experiences. One had fast paced gameplay with great exploration and a killer soundtrack, and the other immersed me in its world and story like never before within its home series, while tweaking the core gameplay I'd previously enjoyed. Only one however can be my game of the month, and while it was close, I'm gonna go with Doom. The game is pure visceral fun from start to finish, and while I did really enjoy Infinite, Doom's use of its genre, music and design create a stellar FPS experience. While I was trying this year to focus on new single player experiences, I wasn't going to shy away from multiplayer ones either. Battlefront 2 was a tentative purchase for me at first as I didn't really care for the first game, but when it was on sale on PSN I saw it was an opportunity to try it, and what do you know, I actually really enjoyed it. It feels like a much more fun game than the first one, and you can actually play as the droids this time so it's clearly the superior title, Droid Decker main by the way. I don't have any overly deep thoughts on this one, just if you've got a couple friends who have it and you like Star Wars I'd recommend you give it a go. It's got a ton of game modes to try and a ton of fun to be had, especially with friends. Shadow of the Colossus is something I've heard nothing but praise for over the years, so when it became free on PS Plus I was eager to try it. The sense of scale in this game is really nice, you really do feel like an ant when trying to slay these mighty beasts and I enjoyed the controls being intentionally awkward to intensify the struggle you face when trying to take down these large creatures. The dour setting of the world provides great atmosphere for your mission, considering the fact that it's something you shouldn't really be doing, and the way the game tells its story mostly through gameplay is really nice. At a point the game did feel like it was dragging the tiniest bit and I didn't really like the final Colossus, my favourites are definitely the flying ones, but I can definitely understand why this is a game that people say you need to experience at least once.
Resident Evil is a series I was familiar with prior to this year. I've played, beaten and loved 5, and I own, avoid and dislike 6, despite being Leon's campaign. I've seen this game be played more times than I can count, so I decided that lockdown was the perfect time to finally play it, and oh my god, I can see why people say this is one of the best games ever made. Resident Evil 4 has the perfect mix of over the top action, exploration and corny dialogue in its intentionally exaggerated story that it's impossible not to love it. The movement, gunplay and inventory management are absolutely stellar as well. I was initially worried about Ashley dragging the game as a whole down, but it's way less intrusive than I thought and the only thing that actively annoyed me was the sliding block puzzle she has to do. Like, why is this here? The PS4 version has a ton of cool side content too, and this has easily replaced 5 as my favourite in the series. But this isn't the last Resident Evil game I'll be discussing today, so we'll see if that changes. If you like survival horror, or funny action horror, or just fun, you owe it to yourself to try Resident Evil 4. A sequel is meant to take what worked from the first game and run with it, trim the fat of what didn't work and add some new additions to an already established formula. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was just reading the dictionary definition of Doom Eternal, a perfect sequel. It keeps everything from the first game that works, improves on what doesn't, namely boss fights, and adds a ton of new elements like a hub world to explore for extra goodies, modifiers that change enemy encounters, and new platforming and movement abilities which keep the pace going better than ever before. It even had a fun, unique multiplayer mode for you and two buddies, which I can say I had my fun with. If you liked Doom, you will love Doom Eternal. There's certainly some stiff competition in March for my game of the month. A fun multiplayer game where I can play as a droid decker, one of gaming's defining experiences, one of the best survivor horror games of all time, and a stellar follow up to February's game of the month. Doom Eternal would have cinched this spot for doing literally everything better than the first game and expanding effectively on the Doom formula, but Resident Evil 4 takes it for me this month. This game is the perfect storm of fun survival horror gameplay with an over the top campy story and amazing inventory management. Eternal came really, really close, but Resident Evil 4 may have become one one of my favourite games of all time. Typically, I'm not that huge into fighting games, but around the start of lockdown I got super back into Dragon Ball and I was itching to play one of the new Dragon Ball games. I wasn't too into how Xenoverse or Kakarot looked, so I went with the one I'd heard the best things about. Fighters has a fighting system which is simple to learn but hard to master, so even idiots like me can get into it. I delved very minimally into the online play and discovered I'm not very good at the game, but I managed to complete the three different campaigns. I started off optimistic, but by the end, my god, I was completely worn out. I had some fun with a good mix of characters, particularly Vegeta and 18, and enjoyed finding which fighters I thought complemented each other the best, but by the end I was completely drained. This isn't really the game's fault. I'm sure if I was more dedicated to the competitive aspects of the game, or actually enjoyed fighting games, I'd be more into it. But as it stands, it's a nice looking and a nicely styled game with a story that far overstays its welcome. You ever just see a game that looks fun purely based on how varied and open it is? Well, thanks to the funny little men it only plays, my eyes were open to the world of Hitman 2. After watching their LP of the game, I wanted to try it out for myself, mostly because of how curious I was about the amount of ways you could go about completing missions in the game. My escapades as Agent 47 kept me on my toes, and I enjoyed how each kill can be achieved in so many different ways. I loved how varied and detailed each of the locations you visit are, and slowly staking out my target before moving in for the kill was super satisfying. You can also even access every mission from the first game in this game, for a price of course. If you like yourself a good stealth game, then I definitely recommend you try Hitman 2. At 
I'd seen footage of gang beasts prior to my time with it. It looked like a goofy old time to be had with friends, and it would just so happen that quite a few of my mates got it over lockdown. I'm not gonna go super in depth with this one. It's stupid, nonsensical fun where you throw your mates about and suck these creatures in the face. It's really funny with enough people, but the PS4 version kept disconnecting from the servers when we had like more than six people. I don't know if this is an issue with the game generally or just the PS4 version, but either way, Gang Beasts was a blast. RE2 Make was my second foray into the Resident Evil series this year. It's a much different experience to every other game I've played in the series so far, with more of a focus on the horror aspect of the series than 4 through 6. It's because of this though that I love Resident Evil 2. My limited ammo made me make sure that every bullet counted, my smaller inventory space made me make tough choices with healing items, ammunition and support items like the wooden boards, but if I discovered I needed something I'd left behind in the chest I was forced to navigate the environment filled with zombies, liquors and Mr X again and again. The tension of just knowing Mr X and liquors are somewhere in the RPD with you is terrifying enough, but when you get to the sewers and a G child jumps at you, it's horrifying. And don't even get me started on the plant dudes at the end of the game. Admittedly I do think the sewers is a bit of a lull in the middle when compared to the other two areas of the game, but its focus on puzzle solving with the chess pieces kept it fresh enough. Both playthroughs of the campaign were brilliant and different enough so I was incredibly satisfied when I'd finished them both. There's also a myriad of extra content which I admittedly didn't delve too much into and I thought the boss fights were only just okay, but if those are the only things I have issue with then I think my stance on this game is clear. I have such a hard time deciding on if I like this or 4 more, but regardless of which I prefer, you should definitely play Resident able to I feel like the game which is my favourite from April is probably pretty clear just based on how much I gushed about it, but Resident Evil 2 is so good man. Like I'm not even super into survival horror, but I love the game to death. If you've played or liked any other game in the series, or even if you haven't, I'd recommend giving it a shot. The Gen 2 remakes are always what I hear people proclaiming as being the best Pokemon games, but I've never actually experienced them myself. Soul Silver, though, from what I've played so far, really does live up to this reputation. Coming back to it from the more recent Pokemon games, the difficulty is so refreshing. One thing I was worried about though was the roster of Pokemon that Johto itself houses and how I build my team around them. I'm not especially fond of a good chunk of Gen 2's roster, nothing against them, I just don't think they're too terribly remarkable. But because of this I ended up getting to attach to Pokemon I never thought I'd end up using. Of course I was going to pick Toadile because I'm a water boy for life and I love his evolution line, particularly Croconaw. But I never saw myself using a Togepi or Pinsir and liking them as much as I do, and yet, here we are. Admittedly though, I've yet to actually feel finish this one. Okay so like I've got this thing that I did when I was younger and I still do now where I'll end up buying a Pokemon game, playing like halfway through the region and then move on to something else, only to come back to it later and beat it. I did this usually when I was a kid when I would go on holiday with my family, and the same things happened here. I started Soul Silver, got about halfway around Johto and then stopped. I was going to take it abroad with me as me and my friends were looking into going on holiday together this year, but well, you know. I have no doubt though that when I eventually do come back to Soul Silver, I'll enjoy it just as much as I have so far. I got out of COD after Modern Warfare 3. I was finished, I was burnt out, I was bored. And yet, this year I found myself playing not one but two games from the franchise. The first was Warzone, the free multiplayer for the Modern Warfare reboot. I'm writing this about four months down the line and I'm still playing Warzone daily. I have no real idea why, but it's the only Battle Royale, aside from another game I'll mention later, that I've properly managed to get into. There's nothing that relaxes me more than just getting my LMG and dropping it big blue with the boys. It's a fun game, but eats up hard drive space like nothing else. So if you fancy giving this one a go, just be wary you won't be able to play any other games because of how much space it takes up. For me and my friends, Yu-Gi-Oh was a massive portion of our childhood. 
I got into the game through the show and I still remember buying my first packs while I was on holiday down Cornwall. I got Mast Beast, Curse of the Mast Beast, Soul of Purity and Light, Hade Hade and Choose One in my first pack. And the rest is history. While I fell out of love with the game and series after GX, I still find myself revisiting it periodically. Legacy of the Duelist itself isn't exactly new to me, but this version of the game is. It's fully updated to have all the cards that are currently in the game, as of the game's release, and updates the layout of the field to reflect the current play format. I love playing through the campaigns for each series, whether I'm revisiting stuff from my childhood or discovering what came after, it's a blast. I love the idea of the Duelist challenges and the deck building, man the deck building took me back to being a kid again. I whipped together my machine deck, my cyber dragon deck and my fortress dragon deck and just went to town with my friends like it was 2007 or 2013 or 2019. Regardless, if you want to revisit Yu Yu as a series or just build deck, then Link Evolution is probably the best way to do it. My favourite game of these three is Warzone. I know, right? I was totally expecting to be giving Legacy of the Duelist the commendation of my favourite game from May, but nope, colour me surprised, it's Warzone. I think the reason for this is, like Pokemon Shield, Times had a massive impact on my opinion of Warzone, as it's still something I find myself playing with friends every single day, and I'm recording this audio in September. Oh well, I got the gold skin for my PKM, so I guess it's chill? I was really excited to play this one. Flipping Death is the follow-up to developer Zoink's previous project, Stick It to the Man, a brilliant little indie game and one of my favourite games I've ever played. Flipping Death, similar to Doom Eternal, is an example of a great sequel, trimming the fat of the first game and expanding upon what worked further. Flipping Death adds a greater focus on collecting and platforming to the formula of Stick It to the Man, and expands it with more collectibles and optional challenges for the player to complete if they so choose. Like Stick It to the Man, Flipping Death is a little on the short side, but the time you spend with it is enjoyable from beginning to end. I don't want to talk too much about this one honestly, because I don't want to give anything away about this funny little romp. Do yourself a favour and give Flipping Death, and Stick It to the Man for that matter, a try. Here we are again with more Resident Evil shenanigans, but this one's a little different to the others. Seven has a noticeably different perspective to the other games I've played so far, being in first person and all. Seven was seen as a big change of pace because it followed up Resident Evil 5 and 6 by taking the series back to its horror roots. But since I'd already played Resident Evil 2 this year, it didn't feel like such a drastic shift for me. I'm gonna say it again, but I really liked Resident Evil 7. The difficulty honestly caught me off guard a bit, and I loved that because I felt so uneasy in the first few hours of the game. The Moulded is such a cool idea for an enemy and they're so intimidating, it's quite amazing. Every area of Seven is pure survival horror goodness with lots of puzzle solving and intriguing encounters to keep you on your toes. I also got to experience the DLC for the game and while I'm sorta of glad I didn't pay for them individually since, you know, they're all on the short side, I still really enjoyed all of them, especially the one where you have to escape the room, the survival mode, end of Zoe not a hero, oh wait that's pretty much all of it. Seven is a treat for fans of survival horror, and another entry in the series I really, really enjoyed. I'm a massive fan of Crash Bandicoot, in fact Crash 2 is one of my favourite games of all time, but I somehow never remember spending any significant time with CTR. I own it still on PS1, but I don't have any real memories or time spent with it. Naturally, I dove on the remake as a birthday present for myself, and I hate myself for not trying to experience this game sooner. This may be the best kart racer I've ever played. It looks beautiful, has stellar track design, great mechanics with how the jumping and drifting work, and it's packed to the brim from characters from all across the series. The only thing holding this game back is how you unlock all this content, but I don't feel the need to go over the microtransaction stuff the game has because I'm pretty sure you've heard it all before. I can't speak on Nitro Fuel as a remake of the original, but I can speak on it as a kart racer and my god it is stellar in every last department. If you love Crash or you just enjoy yourself a good little race around, I definitely recommend giving CTR Nitro Fuel a go.
This one hurt me so bad because I really wanted to have Flipping Death as my favourite so badly for June, but I just had to play it alongside yet another stellar Resident Evil game and the best kart racer I've ever played. I had a lot of fun with all three games this month, but CTR just cinches it. This isn't a knock against Flipping Death or Resident Evil 7 by any means, but damn, CTR is an impeccable game. Still, I implore you to give Flipping Death a try, because Zoink is out here making amazing indie games and I want everyone to experience them. Here we are again, both in Resident Evil as a series and Raccoon City itself. Resident Evil 3 has a greater shift towards combat and linearity in its design, where I feel in this game it's more assumed you're going to fight and kill the enemies you come across as opposed to just straight up avoiding them. Its style is very similar to the RE2 make, but this one, aside from the opening Raccoon City segments, feels a lot less like you're discovering the way by moving around the area and more like you're just making your way from one place to the other. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but I did feel this one is more akin to Resi 4 in its design philosophy than 2 or 7, and after playing those two games before this one it felt more noticeable. The game though leads into this by implementing a dodge mechanic which rewards you for your timing in combat and, to me, has the best boss fights I've played in the series thus far. I loved all the fights in this game and some of the newer enemy types I saw here were also cool, like the hunters and other friends in the final area of the game which I'll keep a secret because they caught me the heck off guard when I saw them because I didn't realise they were even in this game. Overall, Resident Evil 3 is a slightly different take on the RE formula, but nevertheless enjoyable. I stumbled upon the original Battle for Bikini Bottom when I tried to buy the Spongebob movie game in CX in 2014, and they gave me the wrong disc. I went on to not return the game because Battle for Bikini Bottom is miles better and I am really happy it got this remake. As a one-to-one -one redo of the original, it's pretty darn faithful, and I can't think of much that was really changed. The platforming is still great and the level's fun to explore. They even managed to fix Kelp Follows, which honestly is all this version of the game needed to do to be a success. I 100% of the game first time through, and I think if I'm going to return to Battle for Bikini Bikini Bottom in the future, this'll definitely be the version of the game I revisit. It's the exact same game, it just fixes the only bad level. Very solid work, Purple Lamp Studios. Now can you get a word in THQ's ear about maybe getting some Scooby-Doo game remakes? Cheers. So you know how I said before I care very little for fighting games? Well, what if I played another one that's less interesting, less stylized, and based on properties I don't care about too much outside of Batman? Well, here's Injustice. I literally only tried it because it was free on PS Plus. I beat the story which was like, okay, and then had no desire to try the online or anything further. I literally have nothing else to say. It was like, fine, but just not for me. I'm a massive fan of the Retro Studios take on the Donkey Kong Country series, so when it was announced that the original was coming to Nintendo Switch Online, I was really excited for it. It took me some time to shed my habits from the retro games, but once I did, dearie me, there is a reason so many people rave about this series. Donkey and Diddy control like a dream. They're so weighty, but their movement is so smooth. Their levels are expertly designed by our friends at Rareware, or I guess Playtonic now, and packed to the brim with secrets and collectibles for you to grab. The animal buddies are all fun to control and I like how you actually need to earn playing as them. I didn't go for 100%, but this is definitely something I'll be revisiting at some point because it's just pure platforming bliss. I also really like the music and sound effects. It gave me the same sort of vibe that I get when I watch a film from the 80s. The audio quality just does something for me that I simply can't explain. Overall though, I really enjoyed Donkey Kong Country. Donkey Kong Country was probably my favourite game that I played in July. I thought for a while I was going to give this to Resident Evil 3 Make, but I think compared to the other titles in the series I've played so far that 3 might be the weakest? Like it's not bad or even mediocre by any stretch, it's a great time, but Donkey Kong Country is a textbook example of how to make a 2D platformer, and its style, sound and gameplay just put it over the top for me. Resident Evil 3 was great, but I think I enjoyed Donkey Kong Country that little bit more.
Back in 2009, Modern Warfare was the height of socialisation within my school. If you weren't playing Modern Warfare 2, you weren't relevant. I'd gotten into Call of Duty with the first Modern Warfare and had played World of War the prior Christmas, so I jumped on MW2 a week or two after release and absolutely loved it for the multiplayer. I was a stupid child and didn't really care for nor understand the story itself. I just wanted to go to High Rise and get 4 kills in the opening exchange with my FMJ Barrett, gosh darn it. I got Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remastered because it was free on PS Plus and like, I forgot how short these missions were man. That aside, I actually really enjoyed my time with this, more than I was expecting to actually. The story was something I ended up proper getting into even though I knew what was going to happen. I actually understood it this time and enjoyed the missions themselves a lot. It's not what I loved Modern Warfare 2 for back then and it still stands if they announce Modern Warfare 2 Multiplayer Remastered I will buy it day one but as its own thing I got a lot more than I had before out of Modern Warfare 2's campaign. Back in 2013, I played the Tomb Raider reboot. I enjoyed the game, but felt no need to go back to it since it satisfied my taste for that type of game. Seven years later, I played Rise of the Tomb Raider and I've got a similar feeling. Rise is more of the same Tomb Raider action from the 2013 game. It's got some nice exploration and platforming, especially with the optional tombs. Combat and stealth are equally satisfying and it has a story that I started off caring about, but by the end I was just sort of there for the gameplay, which is exactly how I felt about the first game too. Rise definitely just feels like more of the same, with some expansion on what was already established, but what it's more of the same of was already good, so like, I guess that's a good thing? Ah, the game about the funny men! They fall so often it's not quite right, and I can't quite put my finger on why they do it every single time. I like Tiptoe and Hexagon a lot, and any tail tag is a bad tail tag. I must question though, why do they fall so often? Either way, it's fun with friends and very cool. I like the funny men. The funny men in the adventures of Soap and Roach fall short of the mark which Rise of the Tomb Raider sets for August. It's more of the same from the first reboot with some added mechanics, but I enjoyed it about as much as the original, if not a smidge more. I don't know man, maybe in 7 years when I play Shadow of the Tomb Raider I'll have more to say. But for now, Rise is good and satisfies my taste for Tomb Boot action. Hi there, just a quick little note, um, at this point in the video I'm recording the audio for this bit in the end of September, I invested in a new headset microphone, so from this point on the video quality in terms of audio is going to sound a little bit different, I'm hoping it sounds better, but but yeah, uh, this is what the video is going to sound like from, uh, from now on, so, so ta very much. After I finished the Tokyo Ghoul anime, I was itching to experience more of the world, so I grabbed this. Initially I was a bit sceptical about the game as footage I was watching online wasn't doing too much to sell me on it, but one impulse by later on, here we are. Call to Exist follows the storyline of the anime from the end of the first season onward. It's filled with a brim with optional challenges for each level and has an encyclopedia of all the characters and terms to get new players up to speed. The actual gameplay though feels like a toned down Dynasty Warriors, but it definitely feels more satisfying than any footage looks. I especially enjoy playing as Toka, Heise and Bass Kaneki. There's also an online PvP mode where you can meet your own ghoul, inspector or quinks and play against or with other people as well as a survival mode. It's a tad repetitive and on the simple side and I will say it is quite alienating to newcomers, without already knowing the story of the show I'd have been quite lost off. If you're a fan of the show or manga though, there's definitely some enjoyment to be had with this one. Today, while making this mammoth of a video, I've also decided to take on the challenge of not mentioning the first ukulele game when I'm talking about this one. Impossible there, to me, is a clear example of the fact that the platforming geniuses at Playtonic, formerly known as Rareware, are still all too capable of capturing the lightning in a bottle that their work on the Banjo-Kazooie and Donkey Kong Country games showed that they were capable of. Impossible there has a simple premise, stop capital B by defeating him in his lair. 
To do this, you'll need to collect all the members of the Battalion to give you extra hit points in the lair. Mainly by the end of the game, if you get every member of the Battalion on your side, you can take 50 hits in what is the first and final level before dying. And trust me, you will need every single one of those. The lair itself is an intense platforming gauntlet which tests all of the skills you learn throughout the game. Admittedly, a couple years ago when the game was announced, I was incredibly disappointed by the switch to a 2D perspective. But these levels are pure Donkey Kong Country-esque brilliance, and I love solving puzzles in the overworld, not just to grab extra tonics, which are gameplay modifiers by the way, but also to see how I can change each of the levels to unlock its B-side. For instance, freezing a pool of water that's over this level that's to do with fountains, meaning that every fountain in the level, and the level itself, is completely covered in ice. I'm a massive fan of the Retro Studios Donkey Kong Country Returns games, and Impossible Lair manages to not only rival them, but perhaps, at some points, outright outdo them. Did a sequel to Ukulele of all things, which left me feeling uncertain and ultimately disappointed back in 2017, just sneak its way into my top 10 favourite games of all time? Maybe. Just me- Oh crap, I mentioned the first game, didn't I? Okay, so like, for the first week this game was out, I had no idea what it was. I saw it trending on Twitter, and the first thing my brain clicked to was The Wolf Among Us, for some reason. Much like Fall Guys and Gang Beasts, I don't have an awful lot to say here, other than this game is really, really fun with friends. The debates of who the imposter is, having to carefully and quickly complete your tasks, all the while taking information in to make sure you don't get killed, and, if you are the imposter, executing your kills in a manner so that nobody can be sure who's killed who. All of this is amazingly fun for such a simple premise. It's only like 4 quid on Steam too, which actually I had to download for the first time in years to play this. If you've got a couple pals who are interested, I don't think you can go wrong with Among Us honestly. And out of this, Gang Beasts and Fall Guys, I think I actually enjoyed this one the most. Oh lord, I've done it again. I've played another amazing sequel that utilizes literally everything the first game did perfectly. I'm not gonna mince words here. If you liked Donkey Kong Country 1, you will love Diddy's Conquest. The game is more of the same brilliance from the first game, with better bosses, more intense typical platforming, and generally just more DKC fun. Honestly man, Diddy's Conquest is flat out brilliant. There's no other way to describe it. For September, I simply don't think it would be right or fair of me to say anything except Ukulele in the Impossible Lair was my favourite game. Simply put, it's one of the best 2D platformers I've ever played. From top to bottom, the game is so tight, and with its creative ideas like the overworld, the lair itself, and the designs of the levels, alongside an eccentric and charming soundtrack, this game is ideal for any platforming fan, and, like I said, I think it may have just taken a spot among my top 10 favourite games of all time. I really do need to update that list at some point. I said to one of my mates the night before this game came out, what if it's bad? What if despite everything pre-release making the game look great that somehow, some way, it ends up being bad? Well, I've never been more relieved to be completely and utterly wrong. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is, in my opinion, the best game in the series. Literally no contest. Toys for Bob takes what Vicarious Visions learned from their efforts in making the first three games to expertly craft tightly designed levels which really put your platforming prowess to the test. These levels, even as early as the halfway point in the game, get just as difficult as anything the original trilogy would have you doing, and I wholeheartedly welcome that. These levels are all placed within their own world, with a set of aesthetics and themes meaning that each level feels more connected to the last. I love how each of these levels look and the themes that they all use, and this is only intensified with the inverted versions of each level having their own graphical style. Special shout outs to the 11th Dimension and Agapus Dimension, they both look especially lovely. Another thing that I love about this game is that it's clearly much more heavily inspired by Crash 2 than Crash 3, given that there's much less of the vehicle and gimmick levels that were present in that game. 
Crash 2 is my favourite in the series, so when I saw that the game takes great influence from it, and especially considering that I think Crash 3 is actively brought down by the overabundance of vehicle sections, I was overjoyed. 4, instead of having these as their own levels, mixes them in as parts of levels which are more focused on platforming, helping to diversify the gameplay while keeping the game's core focus of platforming at heart. The game also diversifies its gameplay with the other playable characters, who all bring their own unique flavour to the levels. The only thing I can remotely say to criticise the game is that the loading times, especially if you're restarting for the insanely perfect relics, are a bit long, and the soundtrack is just a tad underwhelming at some points when compared to the rest of the series. Nothing bad, just a bit meh in parts, and I had some trouble actually hearing it. I don't know if the sound mixing's off or it's just my PS4's fan going mental, but I thought I'd mention it. Honestly, I could go on and on about all the reasons I adore this game, from its characterization to its story and gameplay, to the sheer amount of love that was clearly poured into this game. I adore Crash Bandicoot 4. It's taken Crash 2's place as both my favourite in the series and in my top 5 favourite games of all time. Time. Again, I should probably update that list. It's October, the scary month, and as such I felt the need to take advantage of the PlayStation Store's Halloween sale to grab my something to fill the vacuous void that the lack of any real Halloween festivities for this year has left me with. Little Nightmares was only like 4 quid, and I'd been curious about it for a little while, so I took my opportunity and grabbed it. In short, I liked it a lot. The game creates this uncomfortable atmosphere through its environments, lightning, and the design of its world, as well as the inhabitants of said world. I only found myself feeling even like a little scared once, but the gameplay and environmental puzzle solving more than make up for it. And the things you come across, the quote unquote monsters, are designed in such an unsettling way, sort of like an uncanny valley sort of thing. It always just makes you feel that little bit uncomfortable, even if you've memorised their patterns. There's also some hidden little collectibles, should you choose to go after them, or in my case, even realise that they're there. Like when I hugged this gnome, I just sort of thought, I have hugged little man, everything will be okay. I didn't realise it was a thing that was actually going to be tallied for me. The focus of this game's on its atmosphere though, and I think, despite the game only being like two hours long, there's enough in this bite-sized little creepy package to warrant giving it a look, especially at its current price. Right, I... I I really like I I think I just it's Crash 4. Little Nightmares is a charming, easily digestible freak show with Burton-esque designs that leave you feeling so uncomfortable all the while you're playing. But there's just no way, despite now being really excited for the second Little Nightmares when it releases next year, the Crash 4 wasn't going to be my favourite from October. It is my favourite game in the series now, with so much love and care poured into every single pore that you're doing yourself a disservice if you're a Crash fan, if you haven't picked it up or don't intend to. It is absolutely amazing. A couple of my friends used to talk about Payday 2 a lot, and in the recent PS Plus sale it was only like 9 quid for the game and a good chunk of its DLC. Payday 2 does for me as a multiplayer experience what Hitman 2 did for me as a single player one. It's a great stealth game during the quiet heists, which are my favourites, as everyone working in unison at different parts of the stage, doing different tasks and objectives to secure the score is super satisfying to nail, especially when using complete stealth or leaving behind as little evidence as possible. It's a great time coordinating with my friends to do this, and having to react on the fly when something goes wrong or we just feel like popping someone is always a laugh. Loud heists are okay too, but I feel like the hectic co-op shooter experience it provides is something I can experience elsewhere, whereas the stealth stuff is wholly unique to Payday. Customization options are great with how varied they are, and the skill tree system which can be completely reset on a whim if you choose to do so and in which you have multiple profiles to experiment with is sick. Payday 2 has a lot to offer and I can't help but feel I'm only just scratching the surface of it so far. This is something I'm definitely going to be playing with friends for quite some time.
While I've yet to talk about it a terrible amount on this channel, Kingdom Hearts is my favourite game series ever. I love the stupid freaks and their funny, wacky story. Melody of Memory, when it was announced, made me stupidly happy. As did the demo when I played that, and now that I've played and beaten the full game, man, I love it. It's a massive celebration of my favourite video game series music, and reinforces that Yoko Shimomura is literally an actual goddess. Playing as Sora from Kingdom Hearts 1 specifically made me unreasonably happy. The difficulty of the game, for me, was just right on proud mode. The fact that Daddy Nomura managed to make a rhythm game that is essentially a massive recap of the series relevant to the ongoing overall story of the franchise is really funny. As ever, I'm excited to see where the story goes after Melody of Memory, but while I wait for that, I'll defo be going back to Melody of Memory time and time again, purely because of how cosy this game makes me feel. Let's not be around the bush here. Payday 2 is a sick multiplayer game and I'm really enjoying it, but what am I supposed to do? Not pick the latest instalment in my favourite series as my fave for November? Melody of Memory is my new happy game. If I'm ever stressed out or just want to kick back, I'll pop it in. I love it. And that's pretty much it. Yes, so usually I don't really play any new games in December since it's the run up to Christmas, and I'll usually just take the time to either just chill with my friends and family or replay some more familiar stuff. So in terms of new games I've played this year, that's actually it. I guess I'll let you guys know what I did get up to in December though, but if you're more interested in my final thoughts and a top 10 of my favourites from the year, then skip to this time here. In between trying to age triple plus all the songs in Melody of Memory on Pro Mode, which at the time of recording I've actually done, I'm now working on getting all perfect runs on standard mode, I decided to revisit some stuff I'd played previously. In an effort to see if I can make the game more interesting, I revisited Pokemon Shield and attempted a Wonderlock run. I wanted to see how the game had held up, given how the conversation surrounding the game has evolved over the past year, and generally I just wanted to see if I could make the game a little harder. In short, I did. I failed my first attempt thanks to a random Linoon using a non-stab, non-crit takedown on a Pokemon 5 levels higher than it, and a Dugtrio with a Rhino Trap basically sweeping the rest of my team. But my second attempt was actually a lot more successful, and I got to use and appreciate Pokemon I'd never actually bothered with before. The likes of Curlia, Alolan Sandslash, Grovile, Ice Q, oh man, Ice Q is my boy now! Agron is my gal too. I liked Laron enough before, but my Agron carried me so hard through a couple of gyms that literally everyone else on my team would have struggled with, and while we didn't end up losing her, she was definitely one of, if not THE MVP of my run. Speaking of MVPs, my tentacruel came in so clutch towards the end of the game, and actively saved the run for me a couple of times during the end game by tanking hits square on the chin that should have absolutely killed her. She's another mon who's going on the list of absolute friends who are also Pokemon. I will say though, while the run made me feel more attached to the Pokemon I was using and inspired some new favourites for me, playing the game again didn't do any favours for my opinion of the experience as a whole. In truth, while I was playing through the opening hours of the game, I was actively getting frustrated at the amount of automation and restrictions that the game places on you. Like why can't I wonder trade from my party or before I've talked to the professor? Why is it railroading me with so many cutscenes, letting me move for two seconds, then just starting another one? Why is the game so barren and straightforward? X and Y fan by the way. Why why does it feel just so uninspired? I get it, Pokemon is a kid's game at heart, but they were never this handholdy or just plain sterile before, so what's changed? Basically, while I had fun doing the run and got attached to some new friends, I think playing it again has actively cemented for me that Shield isn't as good or as fun as I initially thought. I'm hoping the DLC, when I eventually give it a go, can maybe change my mind on that. I also ended up purchasing Minecraft on PSN. I didn't count this as a game I played for December though because this, haha, <laughs> is my third copy of the game. I also own it on PC and 360. This though is probably the most in to Minecraft I've ever been. Me and a few of my friends set a world, we've built houses, got an ender portal, we've got a little farm which is really cute, we killed the ender dragon just last night at time of recording and we're gonna work towards fighting the wither and getting eltrees and stuff. I've never actually done any of this before, it's actually been such a relaxing way to wind down on an evening and honestly, it's such a laid back and varied game that I think, after almost a decade, I'm finally starting to understand why it's such an iconic title and why it's so beloved by so many people. Finally, for some reason, I made the conscious decision to revisit Sonic Generations 3DS. I don't know why really, I just sort of fancy playing it. And after doing a playthrough of all the levels and bosses, I can safely say, yep, this is a dims developed Sonic game. 
Lots of boost to win. The game loves having you boost jump for whatever reason. It's honestly just a lesser version of the console game which isn't nearly as enjoyable. The music of the classic levels being mainly remasters as opposed to remixes, aside from Radical Highway, feels quite lazy. Out of 14 levels, I can say I enjoyed three of them, Radical Highway Classic and both of the Mushroom Hill levels, with the rest just sort of blending together for me. I can at least say the game's consistent because I only enjoyed about three of the bosses as well, Egg Emperor, Bio Lizard and the Time Eater, which is actively better than the HD version of the fight. I would have said Big Arm too, but the fact that the fight can be over in less than a minute sort of kills it for me. Oh, I guess the special stages are fine too. That's honestly all I've got to say about this game. I would say it's held up, but I don't know if staying incredibly mediocre counts as standing the test of time. I, at least I can safely say I don't need to revisit this game for another decade. Or like, ever again. And perhaps most peculiar of all, 2020 brought me and my friends back to Overwatch. We stopped playing it like a year and a half to two years ago because we just got sick of it and how the meta was changing and everything but we've come back to a much different game. Echo's an oddball but I still have fun playing the tanks and the ice woman is still as fun as I remember her being so uh, yeah and perhaps even more surprisingly I'm having a lot of fun with it again which is peculiar but you know what this, this year's been a strange one so I'm not surprised that something like this has happened. Of course, there were also some games that I bought this year with the intention of playing, which unfortunately have fallen into my backlog. I bought Metal Gear Solid 5 Special Edition in the same sale as I bought Resident Evil 2 and I haven't touched it. When the remake was coming out, I went and bought the original Final Fantasy 7 because at some point I do want to try the remake, but because of how distinctly different I've heard the remake is, I want to have a taste of the original first. Lastly, and this is another big one, when Persona 5 Royal came out, a friend of mine gave me his copy of Vanilla Persona 5 since he was getting Royal. He'd previously lent me the game and I'd had a good time with it, but I just stopped playing after the first palace due to the dreaded real life stuff. After he gave me it, I restarted the game, but I haven't actually gone back to it since the very beginning of the first palace. Needless to say, I do plan on getting around to these games at some point next year, and I'm especially excited to revisit P5 and experience Final Fantasy 7 for the first time. And there we have it. That's every video game I've played this year. Every new experience catalogued, discussed and celebrated over the course of this video. I've had so much fun playing all of these different games and making this video talking about them all was a blast. I guess a proper way to end this video would be to discuss which were my 10 favourites from throughout this year. I know I've already said which games were my favourites from every month, but there were some months, one of which has all of its games featured on this list, where I played multiple really great games. Also, just because I haven't included certain games here is by no means me saying that I didn't like them that much in the end. I played a lot of really good stuff this year, and if I'd been doing a top 15, the likes of Hitman 2, Bioshock Infinite and the Donkey Kong Country games definitely would have been featured. Anyway, here's a quick little ranking of my top 10 favourites from throughout the year. Number 10, Call of Duty Warzone. Warzone was something I played for so much of this year, and it made me seriously consider getting back into COD because of how much fun I did have with it for most of that time. However, just because of how much I fell off playing the game by the end of the year, and how by the end of my time with it, I was starting to actively enjoy it less and less, it just stays at the number 10 spot. Number 9, Among Us. This was my favourite multiplayer game I played this year. Among Us is so similar in its style and execution, but has so much depth in terms of how you as an individual play to make up for it. It's so funny playing with a group of friends, and so satisfying to deduce who done it. Honestly, it was the perfect game given the current circumstances, and gave me and my friends something to spend time doing together while we couldn't actually do anything physically or see each other. I didn't realise how quickly I ended up sinking 40 hours into this game. In short, with the right group of friends, this one is rarely boring. Number 8, Flipping Death. Flipping Death was everything I'd hoped for for a Sticker to the Man sequel. It's funny, charming and innovative, all the while doing everything the first game did better and then adds new stuff on top of that. I implore all of you, once again, to give it a shot. Number 7, Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. I'm such an idiot for putting off playing CTR for so long, but now I completely understand why it's so beloved. It is, again, probably the best kart racer ever made. Super satisfying to master and just flat out fun to play. As evident by the fact that it got a remaster, this game never gets old. Number 6, A Hat in Time. 
This is how 3D platforming should be. Constantly fun, incredibly satisfying controls, diverse and well designed levels with interesting themes, and engaging and kinetic boss fights that really take advantage of the 3D space. A Hat in Time stands out from every other 3D indie platform and, I think, can be discussed in the same vein as the likes of Mario and Banjo. Gears for Breakfast knocked it out of the park on their first try, and I can't wait to see what genius they put out next. Number 5. Doom and Doom Eternal. These are the best shooters I've ever played. It didn't feel right only highlighting one of them because, truthfully, they both deserve a spot on this list. Doom and Eternal both know what they want to be and play to their strengths extremely well. They're the perfect storm of satisfying, rage fueled shooting with rewarding exploration and light platforming. These honestly feel like two games I could recommend to anyone and everyone. They're that damn good. Number 4. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. This game is proof that you should never judge a book by its cover. Impossible Air rights the wrongs of its predecessor by delivering precise, varied, and focused platforming alongside interesting overworld puzzles. If Playtonic can apply this amount of fun and excellence to a 3D plane in the future, then I think we'd be in for an absolute treat. For now though, Impossible Air stands as an example of how you make a 2D platformer. Number 3. Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory this game makes me stupidly happy. It's a fun and cute celebration of the history of the series, and serves as the perfect holdover till we get the next major instalment. Maybe £45 is a bit steep for most, but I think this game is defo worth it. Number 2. Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time. A perfect return to form for a series that I already love. It learns expertly from its past to create the best iteration of Crash Bandicoot there's ever been. I hope we see more from the Toys for Bob team when it comes to Crash, because this game is amazing. I will say though, next time I hope they tone down their 106% completion criteria, because now that I've got all of the gems and most of the relics, I feel like what they do for 106% is way too far. Regardless of that, Crash Bandicoot 4 as a platformer and as a Crash Bandicoot game is stellar. Number 1. Resident Evil. Every game I played this year. Properly discovering this series has been a blast. I've loved each entry I've played this year and there was simply no way I could pick between them which one I overall enjoyed the most, particularly between 2 and 4. Resident Evil is even more incredible as a series than I realised, and I can't believe it took me this long to properly decide to explore this absolute masterpiece of a franchise. I now consider myself to be a proper fan of the series, and I can't wait for Resident Evil 8 next year. Resident Evil, the entirety of the series that I've experienced this year, is my favourite thing I've played in 2020. And after all that, here we are. The end of a year. A weird, frustrating and incredibly upsetting year. If there's anything that's helped me through this year, it's my friends, my family and the games I've played. I've been able to rediscover why exactly I love video games so much and it's been an absolute joy doing that. Video games are such a diverse, interesting and gripping medium man. They provide experiences and can tell stories in a way which no other medium can. They're sick honestly and after the fun I've had experiencing all these different games this year, I can't wait to see what I end up playing in 2021.